Hi, it's Tony Chapman. I'm the host of the podcast, Chatter That Matters. 2008, something very special happened to me. I was inducted into the Canada's Marketing Hall of Legends. It's one of the proudest moments of my career because my family was there, one of the proudest moments of my life. You see in this hall are people that have put a dent in the marketplace. We have visionaries who came up with ideas. We have business builders that not only established their brand in Canada, but around the world. We have stewards of brands who found a way to engage the head and heart and hands of the consumer and the media. We have leaders and creators that built campaigns that dance all over media. This is more than the Hall of Legends. If you think about it, it's the Hall of Learning. Imagine the intellectual resource that exists within it. The lessons in life, the journey, the overcoming circumstances, the tight ropes, the way they reinvented and reimagined the world. The American Marketing Association's Toronto chapter came up with this idea of curating this learning. And what they've done is they've created the Legends Journey, Lessons in Leadership. We're gonna take some of the people that are in this hall, spend some time interviewing them, draw out what they bring, not only to your livelihood, but ideally to your life. So thank you for being part of Lessons in Leadership and the Legends Journey. My guest today is someone that I'm very excited to talk to. He's a personal friend, brilliant entrepreneur, self-made. I would say if there's one word that defines him as a character, he's disrupted. He's disrupted every industry he's been part of. He does it with this sort of uncanny insight into identifying unmet needs. He finds a way to attract the best talent, the capital, and he makes things happen. He is a wonderful guy, and with all of his success, obviously comes accolades, it becomes people that are just uh, fans, it becomes critics, everything that goes with being such an extraordinary success. And I believe that his legacy won't be measured by the wealth he's amassed, the businesses that he's created, but what he's giving back to humanity. Please welcome to the Legends Journey, the one and only, Miles S. Nadell. Nice to see you, Tony. Good to see you. Now, I've never, I've known you for years. I never knew what the S stood for. What's your middle name? Spencer. Spencer. Now, where'd you get that from? I don't know. My mother figured it out. I mean, there was not, when I grew up, there was not a lot of Mileses, let alone Miles Spencer. So, I, I don't know where she came up with She that. just wanted you to be unique from day one. Spencer Tracy? I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, talk to me about your mom and growing up, because you certainly didn't grow up with a silver spoon. Look, I... I I think that it's advantageous in life to be disadvantaged and disadvantageous to being advantaged. I didn't have a choice. I grew up in 900 square feet, two bedroom and bathroom apartment. My parents' combined income was $10,000. Um, both my parents were very hardworking people, but I am definitely my mother's son. She was the one who made me believe that anything in life was possible, no matter how humble our beginnings were. She always made me believe that, um, you know, if you dare to dream, anything is possible. And you, you know, we, I've read about this sense that she willed you. you. You've referenced that a few times. And I think it's important for young people to, you know, sometimes we kind of shut out the mentors and we shut out the people around us, but what kind of lessons did she say, you know, you know it's such a small apartment and just sort of getting by. She, she really did say, there's something much bigger out there for you. Well, it's funny because I, I jokingly said to her a few times, you know, mom, I wish we had a few more, few dollars more starting out. And she said, but you wouldn't have as much character. I said, I, I'm, I'm in a position to give up some character <laughs> for a few more bucks. But she, she basically instilled in me the belief that, you know, when you're going through hell, keep going, as Winston Churchill said. And that um, the true test of character in life is adversity. And, you know, when I speak to young people, they said, well, have you ever gone through adversity? I said, well, you, you don't have enough time to hear my stories. Um, but what I, what I did, I never believed that I wouldn't get through any adversity that I, that I went through. And um, I always had the confidence to figure out that between the remarkable people that I associated myself with and my sort of iron wheel determination and God's you know, kindness to me, because I think there's an element of good luck and good fortune that exists for anyone who's gone through the entrepreneurial journey, um, that you can rise to the next plateau in life. And I've been the beneficiary of all three of those. So you have a brother at home, you guys share a room, but I hear that the first entrepreneurial venture of Miles Nadell had to do with taking over that room and a camera. That is very true. When I was 12 years old, I took pictures with a Kodak Instamatic as a hobby hub at summer camp. 
I came back home and I said I wanted to build a dark room, but we had one bathroom. And I turned the bathroom into a dark room, so my family had to go downstairs to the basement to the uh, laundry room, and that was their bathroom. And then um, back then, when we took pictures and processed them, um, the enlarger platform was the toilet, and the uh, I put TV tables in the bathtub. And then when I was finished, uh, it was resin coated paper. And after I washed the pictures, I had to let them dry on the floor. So I put them th spread throughout the apartment. So people had to tiptoe around uh, those pictures. So it wasn't a glamorous uh, evolution, but uh, it's sort of how I started. It sounded like you have a lot of determination, but your mom had a lot of patience. I would say uh, we were both very similar. I'm not sure either of us were very patient, but uh, you know, we sort of believe what Ray Kroc said, persistence and determination alone is omnipotent. That, you know, if, you, you, if there's a will, there's a way. And um, there's a great quote, I think Elon Musk is one of the great entrepreneurs of all time. And he said, never, 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 ever give up. And they asked him, Scott Pelley interviewed him on 60 Minutes, and they said, did you ever consider, you know, quitting? You owed tons of money on SpaceX, on Tesla. And he said, no, never. I'd have to be dead or incapacitated. That's sort of a good frame of mind to most entrepreneurs, I believe, who've gone through adversity. Um, they are committed to get through at, at all costs. So, I mean, you're taking pictures and you're starting to monetize this. And Wayne Gretzky shows up. What's that story? Is that just legend or is that actually the good fortune that shines on Miles Nadell? I, I would say it's just a good fortune. I don't know if it shines on Miles Nadell, but there was a TV show called Don Cherry's Grapevine, and it was CHCH TV probably 45, 44 or 45 years ago. I was 21 years old. And uh, I took pictures um, of, of Wayne uh, on this TV show. And I took one picture of him in a burgundy blazer um, with a shirt and tie. And um, Michael Barnett was his agent at the time, and they liked that picture. And literally, if it wasn't for Wayne and that picture, I would not be here today. So they ordered thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs, uh, pictures of that. And it cost me, you know, 49 cents and I charged $5 for it. And I produced thousands of them and that's what sort of kept me alive. And we've maintained a, a nice relationship since. And um, so that was the evolution of that. And so whenever he did any promotional activities, he would uh, request that photograph and I gladly uh, you know, availed myself of uh, providing them. So you didn't go and get the classic education. And I'm fascinated by that because a lot of parents that were hardworking, what they sort of, their sense of purpose in life was to make sure my kids got educated. And you certainly come from a Jewish community where doctors and lawyers are, are considered, you know, uh, that you've done well, your, your son or daughter has done well. How did you bypass that and why? So the first two, pe uh, we have what I would call a reverse family enterprise. The first two people I hired were my parents. So I was able to um, dull in the pain of not graduating by saying to my parents, I'm not gonna graduate, I will at some point in time, but I'm going to give you a job and um, they came to work with me. I think uh, it was traumatic for me to tell my mother that I was not going to finish school, that I, I really wanted to pursue my entrepreneurial ambitions full time. And I could see on her face that this was not a surprise to her, but I promised her I would get a degree. The question was where, when, and for how much money. And for a million dollars, I got an honorary doctor degree from Tel Aviv University. So I fulfilled uh, my promise to, promise to her. But I have a funny story for you. Um, I got subsidized to go to summer camp um, when I was eight years old. So call it 57 years ago. Uh, it was 1966. And um, at the grand opening of the JCC, which was named after me because I benefacted the, the, the Keystone gift for them to redo it because it was falling apart, my mother came and someone went up to my mom and she said, Mrs. Nadell, you must be so proud of your son, Miles. He's been a success in business, depended on the day. Um, and look what he's done for the community. She said, yes, but you should see his brother. He's a doctor. And, and it's funny, but it was really sort of how my mom and, and my dad would, would have thought of the world, which was, 
My son Miles has been, uh, you know, monetarily successful, and he's built a business. But 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 his brother's a doctor, and that was okay. That's and that you know that's that's great sibling rivalry, anyways. And so you, you know you learn from the school of hard knocks. How did kind of the Gretzky and Barnett and how did that scale? Because you and I probably started the same time in Toronto, and you know you, you kind of went from selling pictures to becoming this force and it to me it was overnight I never I know it's never always overnight but sort of share with the audience that that where you suddenly realized that this wasn't just about the gift of taking the right shot at the right time but it was a gift of saying I can actually create enterprise and drive enterprise look everybody's got a different skill you're a brilliant creative person I I was a business guy I happened to you know, make a living as a photographer. And I think of myself as creative on a different kind of canvas, as much on a balance sheet and business and collections. But I was never a brilliant photographer. I always was looking for how do I create an enterprise out of this creative skill. And I was a professional plagiarizer and synth synthesizer. So I would talk to all of my friends' parents who were in business. And I was like Curious George, I was the human question machine. I would spend as much time talking to my friends' parents and asking them questions about how they became successful as I did spending time with my friends and going out. Because I, I was really curious. How did people create enterprises? How did they create wealth? And from the humble beginnings I started with, that was really my passion. How do I create something that has dynastic value long term? And from where I started, it was a, a, a big leap of faith. You know, but I, I basically said, okay, you know, it's, it's a marathon in life, not a, not a sprint. Uh, let's go one step at a time. And uh, I have, you know, that com obsessive compulsive personality. Like, why would you want one if you could have five? Why would you want five if you could have 20? And why would you want 20 if you could have 50? And um, I believe that the only limitations to success in life were about the ability to dream. And so I was always um, very acutely able with arithmetic. I was very able with numbers. And uh, I met interesting people along the journey. And then in 1986, I met a guy named Mel Stein. I was a photographer and I built a little marketing business. Um, and he had a business called AHA Automotive Technologies that made limousines. I was being driven around in a Mercedes-Benz 190 uh, e, which was a s sort of shorter distance from where you and I are. And I wanted to have the feeling of being in a limousine. Uh, in 1986, I was 28 years old. And people sort of thought I was out of my mind, which may have been the case. And he said he did a reverse takeover of a public mining shell, and that's how we went public. And I was like, why can't I do that? And at the time, there was a guy named Martin Sorrell. And Martin uh, was building a business called WPP. Most people don't know this, it stood for wire and plastic products. It was a reverse takeover. So I said, oh, I think I could do that in the advertising and marketing business. There were no public companies in advertising in Canada. Uh, there used to be a firm called Cofield Brown decades and decades ago. And I said, I think I can build this, and, but I want to build it outside of Canada, not just within Canada, and I want to build it, it as a North American platform. And we started. So we went public on Friday, October the 16th of 87, the day before Black Monday. We got listed in the middle of Meltdown on Friday, October the 23rd, which was the first day in the history of the Toronto Stock Exchange they closed early. We lost 85% of our value in the first trading day. But other than that, life was good. And that's sort of been the story of my do, journey. Do you, I mean, there's a couple of things I want to unpack on that. First of all, when you look back at the times where you're barely on that tightrope, I mean, the wind's blowing, it's Black Friday, things are out of control, out of control. Do you look back at that in your career and say that's some of the finest moments because I had to figure my way through? Or do you look back and go, if I could do it all over again, I would never want to go through that? So there, there are three characteristics to most entrepreneurial success. Um, there's aggressiveness, there's timing, and then there's skill. If you have the first two, you got the good fortune of good timing and you're very aggressive, you don't need the skill. It's when you are very aggressive. So I always say wealth is created by being bold early and right, but bold and early doesn't make up for being wrong. There have been plenty of times where we intuitively thought, I thought that we had the right strategy. 
and we thought timing was good and then all of a sudden there was some black swan event that happened and we had to navigate through those choppy waters and through those uh, you know winds that are in front of us um, to, to navigate to terra firma but look when you start with nothing and you have big ambitions you go through adversity that's just the nature of timing you know uh, warren buffett talks about he's the he's the greatest investor of all time so buffett's compounded his net worth tenfold over the period of when he was 65 to 90. he compounded his net worth at about 9.6 percent but during that period of time berkshire hathaway stock went down 50 percent or more three times so the reality is nobody's got a straight line to success most people go through ups and downs and really the true test of uh, entrepreneurial ability is the ability to get to terra firma in the face of that adversity but to also learn from it uh, i would say that my tolerance of risk is different today than it was sort of when i started with nothing but on the other hand i still have ambitions i just there's a great line from a friend of mine named J. Ira Harris. He passed away and he said, being richer is not as good as being poor or as bad. As good as it feels to make money, it really sucks to lose. So hopefully as you get older, if you're a smart entrepreneur, you decide about managing risk very differently because what you don't want to do is go backwards and start de novo again. And not all entrepreneurs understand that. They think the same playbook they started with at the beginning is the playbook that they will die by. And that's not my belief. You know, when I was in Young Presidents Organization, they talked about, you know, there was three kinds. There were the entrepreneurs, the hired guns, and then the people that inherited wealth and, and had that responsibility and all come with a different sense of uh, a burden and skill set. You always struck me as someone that kind of had the hired gun mentality in a sense, you weren't, I'm not saying you weren't emotionally vested in the business, but you could stand back almost that you were hired to run the business, but at the same time had that incredible tenacity as an entrepreneur, the sense of this impatience to see things through. Is that a fair assessment that you sort of had that, that both sides working for you as opposed to, to me, an entrepreneur is constantly sprinting and maybe a CEO is a marathon. You, to me, you were, you're a bit of both. I think of myself as someone who has a good left brain and a good right brain. I think I am highly analytical, very numerate, but I'm also creative. And I understand the idea that says, focus all of your efforts to figure out the solution. Use other people's advice and counsel and wisdom and guidance, but also use your own gut instinct. And I was pretty good at figuring out where was the go-to path that had a high probability of leading to a successful outcome. I also am perpetually curious. Like I am always asking people what they're doing, why they do it. I read voraciously to try and understand what golden nugget of information can I take from somebody who's been uber successful that I can integrate into what we are doing or pitfalls to avoid. Do you think that's advice for the next generation is to maybe dive a little deeper beyond the headline and the Instagram moment and really open up your mind to curiosity and, and, and just because there are those nuggets available. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably the greatest gift you can get is somebody else's learnings, but it also takes, you know, you have to have an appetite for it. Look, I think a couple of things. I think one of the skills that a lot of entrepreneurs today do not have is they don't understand arithmetic. And what I mean by that, this is not, you know, higher learning mathematics, but the ability to add, subtract, multiply, and divide intuitively in your mind. I always, you know, talk to our guys upstairs and I'm like, put your computer away. You know, tell me, you know, what's the law of seven? You know, money doubles every 10 years at 7% or it doubles every seven years at 10%. Like, wh what does this business really look like? What is the true margin? It, what is the sustainable margin long-term? And, you know, everybody is also very short-term oriented and that's true with a lot of young people today. I say, tell me what the business could look like 25 years from now. And people look at you like dumbfounded. And, you know, the reality is, you got to have a path to how you're going to create value. And I think that success is not about understanding possibilities of outcome, but probabilities of outcome and taking steps to increase the probability of a successful outcome. 
when I have these conversations with a lot of people, they look at me like I'm talking Chinese, like it, it's just a foreign language to them. But you know, business is an objective exercise. It's not that subjective. It's subjective how you get there, but it's pretty objective as to, you know, what's the revenue, what's the margin, what's the profitability, what's the free cash flow, and will it grow over a period of time? And if so, what has to happen? And what's the likelihood that that happens? And most people don't look at the world like that. So I say to young people, first of all, learn arithmetic. Numbers don't lie. And most importantly, develop a plan that you think has a high probability of getting you to where you want to be over the next one, two, five, ten years. And when did you feel you learned that? Is that through experience that you share it, or did, is that something that's your superpower from day one was the ability to look beyond the next month or how famous I'm going to be or my exit strategy and really start looking at almost like, as you said, Buffett does, which is a much longer horizon? Because I think in the Western society, we've lost a little bit of that scale of, of vision, haven't we? I would say, you know, we've been doing this for 43 and a half years full time, sort of 54 years part time when I started. But it would be misleading for me to say, oh, no, I had this superpower and I really understood at the beginning. I, I mean, for we're an overnight success story. It just took 30 years, the first 30 years to survive in the last, you know, sort of 13 years to 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 prosper and to refine. I always had certain skills, but I don't think I followed all my disciplines that I have today back then. You just learn through eight hair transplants and lots of, you know, ups and downs and, you know, adversity. And then you say, okay, well, what works and what doesn't work? And I think, you know, there's a great line that Buffett says is the difference between successful people and really successful people is really successful people say no most of the time. I, early on in my career, there was never an opportunity that I didn't think was interesting, exciting, and you know, that I could take advantage of. And then over time I said, okay, is that a great opportunity or just an opportunity? And then so as I got older, probably by the time I was, you know, call it uh, 45, 50 years of age, I said, okay, um, let's play the long game and, and, and build success as a marathon, not a sprint. And I started to realize the things that I thought through my own experience that were gonna be great versus good versus mediocre versus poor. And I look at Miles as I, you know, I've known you over the years and follow you. One change I've noticed is, you know, I'm gonna put a picture of the fire in the Muskokas. I'm gonna actually write, I'm gonna interview somebody. I'm gonna start putting my thoughts out there. Are you? Finding that work-life balance, you're, you're now changing a little bit from being completely, as you said, compulsively obsessive about the creation of wealth and maybe more your emotional wealth, your intellectual wealth? So in 2015, I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, and sleep apnea. Other than that, I was healthy. I have a daughter in recovery. At the same time, I decided that affluent and dead was not a good combination. So I've lost 87 pounds since then and I have focused a lot on my family. My daughters, uh, I have two daughters, two stepdaughters, and my wife was very helpful to me about saying, you know, God's given you a reprieve and given Samantha a reprieve and you should use this as an opportunity to redefine what your future looks like. And then I, I've, I've always believed um, the Forest Witchcraft quote, which says 100 years from now, no one will ever remember the car you drove the house you lived in, or for that matter, how much money you had in your bank account, but the world may be a different place if you made a difference in the life of a young person. So I was always very generous and philanthropic even when I couldn't afford to. Yeah. I would make pledges and my CFO would say, we can't afford that. And I said, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll figure out how to get there. And then I guess when I turned 65, it's sort of, I, I've been thinking about I have a whole plan called LEM, Life After Mile Z. And uh, I have put in place a plan and we have a fantastic management team, an amazing CEO, Trevor Maunder, who's been with me for uh, 23, almost 24 years, and he's 51 years of age. And I said, okay, like, we don't have to wait for me to die for me to, you know, delegate responsibility. And I, I then said, like, what I'd like to do is some things 
you were kind enough to say, I, I think my legacy that I'm most focused on is being known as someone who is kind and generous and always there to be accounted for. And one of my dreams in life is to create a school of entrepreneurship because what I really believe is that countries create wealth by creating more entrepreneurs. So I want to go there as I finish, but I don't want to lose this philanthropy and tell a personal story. I knocked on your door one day and, and you know, I knew you and I had, which was great. And I said, you know, I, I, Regent Park needs you. And it was an inner city school. And at the time I would probably say most of your philanthropy was in Israel, a lot of the stuff you did in the Jewish community center. And you looked and you went down there and you said, and I had asked, I think I was like nervous, shaking, asking you for, I hope I don't mind sharing these numbers, 250,000, he said, that's ridiculous. How about 2 million? Yeah. And they were just blown away, but they weren't just blown away by the fact that you wrote that check. It's how much you personally got involved down there and how interested you were. And I think that led you into Harlem right afterwards. And you started working in the inner cities in Harlem. So Canada needs to understand that, that there's so much extraordinary people that have created wealth that want to give it back and are doing it in a very intelligent way. What is your strategy with philanthropy? So go back to Regent Park. I didn't know a lot about Regent Park. As you said, I focused a lot in the areas that I knew. When I went down there and I met Art Eggleton, and he told me that if it wasn't for the Boys and Girls Club Youth Center, he would have been on the street. I realized that this was a project that should get done. It was underwater physically. Um, it was a tired institution. And I thought, you know what? I should stand for not just supporting the Jewish community, but supporting those communities less well served and young people who deserve a chance. And when I went there and I brought Mark Tashira, who was the first baseman for the New York Yankees, and that's how I got involved with Harlem RBI, um, I realized that there, this is something, it needs a champion. And I thought that my family and I could make a difference and my wife Kelly, uh, we, we, we sponsored the youth center and we got involved. But I'm very lucky because a lot of my team, you know, Deirdre McMurdy and uh, Dennis Howe and Trevor Monder and Shawnee, morning they all volunteered time and talent uh, to supplement my treasure to help them navigate through challenging times and one of the things that I did learn is that time and talent you devote is even more fulfilling than just writing a check Writing a check pretty easy but it's not that emotionally fulfilling seeing the fruits of your labor help those less fortunate is very gratifying and uh, you know the young aspiring business student meets the successful businessman and he asks him, how'd you become so successful? The older gentleman looks at him and he said, well, I jump up my opportunities. And the young guy says, yes, but Mr. Chapman, there's so many opportunities in the world. How do you want one to jump at? Tony says, I don't, I just keep jumping. So for 65 and a half years, I've been in the just keep jumping business. And I knew when I went there, this is wonderful. And I sort of thought it needs a champion I don't know how, there's lots of people that have deep pockets. I'm not sure how many have long arms in deep pockets, but I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do this. And as you said, it was a lot more than I anticipated, but you know what, it was worth every penny and more. And people say, well, you were very kind. I said, no, 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 I'm the guy who was the recipient, my family and I were the recipient of the, of the extraordinary gratification of helping. And it's enabled the, you know, the community center to move forward. And uh, we were there at the beginning and there's something, you know, quite special to have that opportunity. So Miles, I want to take advantage of having you and understanding that the people listening are going to be inheriting the country Canada going forward. I mean, this is the American marketing system. This is the Toronto chapter. They knock it out of the park year after year for everything they're doing to sort of mentor and advise and grow and create. And what would you do to get our economy going again. You're a math guy, our productivity is in a free fall, uh, our per capita debt. I mean, every metric I would look at and say, this is not a country right now that's setting that generation up for success. So I'm making you prime minister right now. What would you do to have this incredible country, Canada, be the showpiece for the world in terms of freedom, democracy, and the ability to pursue and, and dare to dream? So. I'm the wrong guy to ask. 
um, because I would never be in politics and uh, nobody would ever. I'm not, I'm, I've, I've got the power to make you prime minister for this I moment. I think the challenge is we have developed over a long period of time of culture of liberalism and we have lost some of our entrepreneurial spark. What made the country great was a few things. First of all, the good fortune of having being nat rich in natural resources. We still are. We have a great freedom and democratic culture, um, which is, you know, for the most part, a safe place to be and a place that welcomes immigrants. I, I'm a big proponent of immigration. I, I, I believe that, you know, my family, you know, generationally were immigrants. Um, and I think that's very important. And a lot of the, the immigrants who come are very entrepreneurial and they start from nothing and they, you know, they, where, whether, whatever their ethnic derivation is, they come from humble beginnings and they make themselves a success and they help stimulate the economy and they encourage their children to get educated and their kids try and follow in that footstep. We need to be a society that says, if I create value, I will liberal monetize that value. I'm a little worried that, you know, the governments have focused a lot on taking the fruits of the labor of uh, the country and doing more to have, you know, liberal programs and not enough about, you know, free enterprise. Larry Kudlow had a great quote. He said, capitalism is the greatest path to prosperity. I fundamentally believe that. We need to encourage more people to take risk, to create enterprises. When they got rid of 2 million jobs in America in 2008, 18 million jobs were created by small businesses over a five year period. We need to create more people that want to create more small businesses. We need to create more government initiative to support small business and entrepreneurship. We don't talk a lot about that. Unfortunately, the Liberal government doesn't talk about that at all. And I believe that the only way you're going to make this country as great as its potential is to create an entrepreneurial culture where we're trying to stimulate small business, we're creating economic rewards and taxation to invest and invest in capital expenditures, etc. That's the way you build. We have a rich country in natural resources. We have all the opportunity in the world to be a great country. But I'm not sure. The other problem is that we are not a country that believes it's a great country. You know, the one thing about America, as you know, they, it's the greatest country in the world, according to every American, you know, land of the free, home of the brave. And it is a country that believes in Horatio Alger, that you can start from nothing and you can build great success. And even if you fail, okay, then you get up and you do it again. It's not the mindset of most Canadians. I think part of who I am today is because I spent 35 years in New York City and it just changed my whole mindset about risk and reward and taking opportunity, taking chances, going through adversity. And um, I was proud of that. You know, I, I never, I was never ashamed that I'd gone through adversity. Um, I was proud to be able to say, I come from humble beginnings and first two people I hired were my parents. And you know, Mike Milken taught me that the dream is not an American dream. It's a universal dream. It's a Canadian dream. It's a dream in India or Pakistan or Israel or Saudi Arabia or the UK or Greece or France or Italy. And there are great success stories. And the reality is we need to do what we have to do to support and invest in entrepreneurs to fulfill those ambitions and dreams. And they can happen. People say to me, is there the same opportunity when you started? I say, there's always opportunity. And there'll be opportunity 25 years from now. Maybe there's more competition, but there's also more capital. You know, what, what was a restriction 25 years ago is different than it is today but there'll always be opportunities. There will always be another Elon Musk. There'll be always another Mark Zuckerberg. There'll always be, you know, those kind of people who come from humble beginnings and just make it happen. And there's lots of, you know, I love meeting people who have six hot dog stands. They say, how'd you start? How'd you get your first one? How'd you get your second one? You know, if you look at the real estate uh, industry in Toronto, you know, a lot of it has been populated by either immigrant Jewish Holocaust survivors or immigrant Italians. 
and they came from zero and they didn't speak the language necessarily and they had no capital and no contacts and no resources. They went one house at a time and, you know, fast forward 50 years later, they've got, you know, huge dynastic wealth that came from just putting one foot in front of each other every day. And, and your final thoughts for young people listening and saying, you know, if they had a chance to ride down an elevator with you and they just said, Miles, you know, you've, you've met some of the best people out there. You're considered one of the great ones in our, what, what, what can you share with me on this elevator ride that I can put in my knapsack for the rest of my life? Well, two things. First of all, I don't think I'm one of the great ones. I think I am just a average, everyday, run-of-the-mill guy who happens to have had some good fortune of economic success. And I think you can never have too much humility. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten older, I realize, like, you know, there by the grace of God, because I could give you, in the last 45 and a half years, that there were lots of, there were lots of pitfalls that could have been, you know, terminal and whether it was good fortune whether it was timing whether it was ingenuity or some combination uh you know they were not terminal and i i was blessed so one you can never be too humble the second thing is follow your passion you know henry ford said if you love what you do you'll never work another day in your life when somebody says to me you know my daughter is a chef it's not that lucrative to be a chef. I say, it's fantastic. You should be so proud of her. And they go, why do you say that? I say, because she's doing it, because she loves it. And nobody ever became a chef just for the money. And, and if she loves it, it's fantastic. I met somebody yesterday who was amazing. And she's in retail. And uh, she used to work for Indigo. And she was a remarkable person. And she has a math degree and a business degree. But she's a buyer at a high-end luxury brand called Brunello Cuccinelli. And... I had this 45 minute conversation with her and she said, my parents beat up on me all the time. It's like, with this education, why are you doing that? She said, I love it. And if you love that, it's, it's fantastic. You know, we have a, I have a stepdaughter who's in social work. And I say, it's wonderful. If you're gonna make the world a better place, it's really tremendous. You don't do amazing things that fulfill your soul if you're motivated by the money. You do things that fulfill your soul because you're motivated to make a difference and to be exceptional at it. And if you do, you'll figure out how to make a living. And I think too many people today are too focused on how do I get rich tomorrow? You know, what's the next CBD? What's the next, you know, cryptocurrency, etc. And I believe that, you know, creating value is a marathon, not a sprint. Tell me what you think your life should look like 25 or 50 years from now, and let's have a conversation. Most people are worried about the next 25 weeks or 25 months. And that's the thing that I would encourage people. Take, play the long game. Because if you do, you'll be more emotionally gratified and it will work out for you more economically. You know, Miles, you've, you've met some extraordinary people in your life. You, your, your first mentor, without question, was your mom. I realize that. but. Who's played a major role in your life? And what's the value you place in mentorship? Well, I think all of us over time, if we're fortunate, have met people that along the journey who have mentored us intentionally or unintentionally, and we've learned from. I would say my father-in-law, Lloyd Bogler, probably was the most profound influence on me because I got to ask him four million questions every Friday night. And he was kind to answer those questions. But look, you know, Isidore Sharp, Leon Cooperman, Howard Schultz, Ken Langone. I mean, the list is long and distinguished. And I learned different things from different people along the way. I love the young people in our organization. That's what really gets me coming to the office every day when I'm here, to spend time with them because they're curious, uh, they're insightful, uh, they are interested and inquisitive and they love to hear the stories and that's part of my motivation that if I can help encourage them. I also think it's part of the culture of peerage that we attract great young people because we spend the time to mentor them and to train them and if we find someone wonderful what I basically say to them is look your job is to be here for the next 30 or 40 years. 
Even when I'm not here, your job is to be here. And we do weird things like we'd say to people, we love you, we care about you. We're there for you in the face of adversity. If your family's got a problem, I will be there. I'm the chief medical officer of the company. If you've got a medical issue somewhere in your family, I will be there to find you medical care for any of your loved ones. I think mentorship is the difference between a mediocre culture and a great culture. And it's also, if you spend the time it's the most gratifying thing for a, a senior person in business is to have that relationship with young professionals or young administrative people. And look, one of the things I pride myself, I mean, Maria Pappas has been with me for going on 39 years. She started when she was 22, okay? It's one of the greatest stories that I can tell is, look, we're like the Roach Motel. You can come in, but you can never leave. You know, Trevor, 27 years. Walter Campbell just retired after 35 years. You know, the list is very long and it's a badge of honor for me that people have come on this journey. And through that, they've gotten educated. They've gotten, bought their first home. They had a family. They've created independent wealth. They've got the wherewithal to retire. I think that's something that I take great pride in. And attracting great young people who are curious and ambitious and intelligent. Uh, if you invest in them, I think it pays huge dividends dynastically. You know, Miles, I always end my shows and my takeaways, my three takeaways. The first one is, uh, one of my favorite authors is Mordecai Richler, St. Urban's Horseman, Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz. You remind me a lot of Duddy Kravitz in the sense of that curious mind. He was always asking the elders. He was never, couldn't, his, his grandfather's lesson is land. I mean, he, he was a kid that said, I don't know it all, but I want to know it all. And, I, and, I, and the second thing is a, is a great lesson in life for everybody is, is your left brain and right brain, but know your numbers, know your math. Understand where you want to go. Don't just get caught up on your exit strategy. But the third one is a combination of the two, is the sense to follow your passion, but keep jumping. And I think what I'm taking away from this, because I know that as much as you love the fires in Muskoka and you're becoming a little bit more thoughtful in terms of what you're writing and such, you're just jumping as hard as you did 45 or 50 years ago. And for that, I'm just uh, honored that you were part of the uh, Legends Journey, Lessons in Leadership, and, uh, and this mashup with Chat of the Matter. So thank you, my friend. My pleasure. I'll give you two things in the end. Okay. One is if you said to me, what do you want your legacy to be? I would like at my funeral that people say he was kind. You know, Tom Hanks said there are three keys to happiness, kindness, kindness, and kindness. So if you said, is there anything more important than your success? I say, yes, being, being thought of as a kind person, a generous person. So Mark Tashira gave me a great line. He said, I want to be known as a good family guy, good community, community guy, and oh, by the way, I played baseball. I'd like to be known as a good, a loving family guy, a devoted and generous, uh, a generous and devoted community guy, and oh, by the way, he was in business. But most importantly, I want everybody who's ever interacted with me with say, he never said no to me about any charity. He never said no about helping out, being able to, you know, there are four reasons why people call me. One, could you invest in my business? Two, how about my fund? Three, donate to my charity. And four, hire my kid. Uh, nobody says, hi, how are you? And, but I think it's, there's a great, in the, in, there's a great thing in the Bible that said, to those who much is given, much is expected. I try to do my best to show up every day. And the role model that I want to be for my kid is always being there to help those less fortunate. And I would say to you that, you know, when I look at long term, I would hope that I've left the world a little bit better shape than when I entered it. And if my family and I can do some of that, uh, we would have a life well lived. I am grateful for the foundation of where I started. Unlike most people, I never lose sight of where I came from. I'm proud to have come from humble roots. I came from Toronto. The Toronto chapter of the American Market Association is where I started. I started from scratch, and it's my pleasure and privilege to do anything in any modest way to recognize and show my appreciation for the 
foundation I got from the AMA in Toronto. When I got that recognition in 2012, it meant a lot to me. I was traveling most of the time. I wasn't going to miss that. I brought my whole family. I said, this is where we started. Is that the distillery? I was there. Yes. It was, uh, it was a beautiful night. Thank you. It's an honor and privilege to be here. And thank you for taking the time to uh, spend with me. And I hope we do more of it in the future. We certainly will. Thank you. It's Tony Chapman. Thanks for listening. And let's chat soon.